Anun hor ye vort vo ye vokvuin srpo amen. Imastutyun hor Jesus dur mez imastutyun. Es Paris horel ye vkosel ye vkordzel arachiko hamenanjam. Ichar horutots ipanit sevi kordzots pergiamez ye vogormiako arradzots ye mez pazmamegatsas. Parkor ye vort vo ye vokvuin srpo ajum ye mist ye vavidianes vavidenits amen. Urem gisharan lagen sirder gartal matios avedarane arak cevo mushad arak ampopen garevor geder or araci yergu tasun tasun taskin ashxetsing araci pan mezi amar garevor e vor besi asvaza shunchi pnakira gam povan tagutin askdank betke imedi bahenk vor Vorbes Krutun, Vorbes Kraganutun, Marte Herinagas Kitkerun, Te Povanta Gutun Asvaze, Haidutun Asusme Gaze, Sagan Kravor Gelb Bahel Yevdergats Dele, Mart Kaini, Anor Mengsenk, Avedaran Es Mateosin. Yevasi Garevor, Evore de Burakanchur Herinag, Il Vojov, Il Sevov Gnergatsne, An Inchvor Asvazain Ev Havidenagane. Ima Karov Matios Avedaranin Orinagi Hamar, Matios Herya Lalov, Yev Herya Jovurtin Kraz Lalov Askirke, Garevor Ansnagan Nabadag Nerune, Tivbeg, Guzer Herya Jovurtin Hamoze, Voras, Jesus Vorun Irenk Hachetin, Nuin Irenk Spasats Messiane. Ugas Vorgekere Romeati. Հրամանը դարիմ եվ այլն, չգրնան նույն շեշտն է, որով է դեմ հրոմեացին է լուր աչունեին հին գդագարան են, գամ Մեսիայի մասին։ Բայց հրիա ժողողութ կիրեին, որ Մեսիան մի դիկատ սպացեին, հետևապար Մատիոսը ավերի շեշտ � մարկարերությունը որ գս է այդպես եվ այլնում։ Ուրեմ են կարը որ ասկնալ մարդկային հեղինագի ոջը նբադակ ինչու կրած է և ասոնց մասին առաջի նիստի մեջ խոսեցանք։ Նա որ առաջի նիստի մեջ լսինք, որ շատ մը ասվածապանդեր որ առաջի հին կիրկերն են, պենտը թկ, I forgot, I'm continuing in Armenian, I should switch to English in case you have questions, please, please let me know. So, as we said in the first session, it is important for us to be aware of the fact that the biblical text is a human text. It's like a coaxial cable that contains the divine message that human language, text, uh, grammar, uh, culture, uh, geographical, scientific limitations, all form the channel in which the divine and eternal and infallible message is conveyed to us. So it's, it's important for us today, um, we who are divorced from the original events at least 2000 years, uh, to be able to peel off these human layers uh, cultural, uh, whatever, lang linguistic, and to be able to reach to, to the message. To do that, we need to know who the author is, what was the intent of writing the letter or the, the document, what was his main theological concerns, uh, to whom he is writing. And we did this in the first session of our uh, uh, talk. We also in the first session said that Matthew, uh, most scholars uh, believe, is presenting his gospels his gospel in a five-fold structure, imitating the first book of the Old Testament. Just like the first book of the Old Testament kind of introduces the concept of covenant with God and then ultimately the Torah. Uh, likewise, Matthew being the first book in the series uh, is presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ in a five-fold structure. Uh, these five-fold are woven around the five or five key lectures or discourses that Jesus has given, and the whole structure has introduction and conclusion. And uh, uh, the first session we also discussed about the introduction and, and how it fits, uh, kind of the beginning as uh, the author introduces who Jesus is, 
We spoke about the genealogies, the human genealogy, the divine genealogy being born of the Holy Spirit. And then we discussed baptism as being the staging public announcement of the uh, uh, ministry of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the end of the rule of Satan uh, and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Last session, which was a session, session two, we focused on the first discourse, and that was the Sermon on the Mount. Now that Matthew presented us with this whole concept of uh, the new covenant that Jesus has came to preach, we need to know what the contents of this new covenant is. Uh, and sure enough, chapters five to seven uh, form a literary unit that includes the three chapters, include the teachings of Jesus. At the beginning of chapter 5, we read how Jesus went up to the mountain. At the beginning of chapter 8, we read how Jesus came down from the mountain. So in between these two verses, there's no mention of any movement that Jesus does. He cathismata, he sits on the floor, and he uh, people around him, and he starts teaching. And this teaching is known as the Sermon on the Mount, which represents, in a way, the new Ten Commandments. Just like uh, Moses gave the Ten Commandments to establish the Torah and the people, all people of God, uh, according to Matthew, Jesus on the top of the mountain gives the terms of the new covenant. And very briefly, we discussed the structure of this unit, Sermon on the Mount, and we said start with an introduction. Introduction includes the Beatitudes, blessed are those. And we said that these uh, Beatitudes function as um, kind of prere prerequisite of who is qualified to be uh, a member of this covenant with Christ, because uh, with God through Christ, because ultimately we are documenting the terms of a covenant with God, as Jesus says, "Aryun uh, noro uchdi." It's the it's my blood of the new covenant. So now we're learning what are the terms of this new covenant. But before that, uh, Matthew very nicely um, uh, quotes Jesus, where he talks about. Who are those who are worthy to be uh, members of this covenant? The poor in spirit, the peacemakers, the, etc. And we'll discuss this uh, uh, in details. He then proceeds in the Sermon on the Mount to discuss, but what are uh, uh, these members of the covenant to do? And he discusses two very important aspects of um, active membership in the covenant. Uh, the salt and the light, and we discussed it lengthily last time, and we said that the salt in those days was used to preserve meat, which was a very, very express, expensive uh, commodity, and they would wrap it with salt so it stays fresh for the next use, which could be in two, three days in a week. Uh, if the salt loses that function, it's it's worthless now. They put it on the floor uh, so people can step over it because there's uh, dirty waters passing by or whatever, so it will uh, keep the ground clean. Uh, and the Lord uh, tells us in this teaching, which is chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, that we are to function as those who not only receive this precious commodity, which is the terms of the covenant, but also to preserve it and make it available through us to next people we'll come in touch with, next day, next generation. That's the requirement of an active member of this new covenant. He also spoke about the light, and we said in those days, um, light was a very precious, uh, again, commodity, very expensive. Unless you were king or very rich man, it was very difficult to light your lamps 24 hours. So if you had a lamp and it was lit, you wouldn't hide it under uh, the table. You'd put it on top of a high place so it uh, enlightens as uh, larger area as possible. Uh, here also the Lord says, if you have faith, that faith cannot be dormant or hidden within you. Uh, that faith must radiate people must the consequences of your faith in your action when i teach this to the youth i used to quote kanye west Pesan. now he's i guess too old for the younger generation he says um, not only to talk the talk but to walk in other words we can't say i believe in jesus christ 
But then what? Then I curse and I don't respect my parents and don't forgive my enemy. I don't help the poor. Uh, I don't read the scriptures. Bakash. So uh, Jesus is very wisely telling us, if you have that light, that light must radiate and we must see the positive consequences of having that light. But now we're about to start the terms of this new covenant, a serious question is about what happens to the Old Testament. And of course, Jesus starts with this very uh, well-known phrase, do not think, do not think that I came to abolish, do not think that I came to reverse, because all the testaments are made by God. They cannot contradict each other. So no testament can be against another testament, because God is eternal, God is always correct, God is infallible. The covenants he make cannot be contrary. He cannot say, don't kill today. And then to such that, you know what? Go ahead and kill. I change my mind. That's not how it works. All the covenants must agree with each other. The reason there's a new covenant, usually it's to fulfill, to, to expand. And that's why Jesus said, I did not come to abolish, but I came to fulfill. And this, uh, the, this verse, do not think, which is kind of the third subsection. In other words, what about the Old Testament now? The, we, the Israelites, the people of the Old Testament, are we now nothing, gone? So he says, no, you are part of the invitees to upgrade your uh, you know, understanding of this revelation and to continue uh, being the people of God. The fourth subsection we discussed, we discussed last time was, you have heard. And here Jesus compares the old with the new. How? The old, as interpreted by the Jewish rabbinic tradition, dwells on the letter, while the new dwells on the spirit of, of the teaching. For example, do not kill. So uh, in the old rabbinic interpretation, you can annoy, you can harass, you can beat up, you can torture. As long as you don't, you don't kill him, you're not liable. You're not, uh, you, you haven't sinned. Until you actually kill, then the law says, ah, oh, you killed, you're a sinner now. Jesus says, for the new covenant, he says, do not even anger your brother. Because beginning to anger him may lead into a dispute, an argument, a fight, and then uh, one of you may be killed. So these um, paragraphs, which Jesus compares the old with the new, uh, again, are very, very well known as, you have heard, but I tell you. You have heard but I tell you. And after this comparison of the old with the new, our Lord goes into some solid examples of how he, the seal of the new covenant, understands or interprets the duties of the members of the covenant. Prayer, fasting, almsgiving, uh, courage, um, uh, fighting temptation, all these things are uh, mentioned in the fifth section of the Sermon on the Mount. Finally, at the conclusion, Verses 24 to 27, we read a commitment. And that commitment is very important. Unless you are serious, uh, don't play games with us. So if you read uh, chapter 7, I think it's verses 23 and following. 24 and following. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain fell, the flood came, and the winds blew, and and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So you see, uh, the Lord is saying, being a member of this new covenant is not only hearing and saying, yeah, it's beyond that to commit yourself into doing it. Uh, we can't uh, be passive, or as the book of Revelation sa says, lukewarm members of the covenant with Jesus. It demands proactive membership. Finally, uh, uh, we concluded last week, I know how uh, much in details, about the conclusion, how he wraps up uh, this whole Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting, if you read chapter 8 now, which is what we're going to talk today, 
Chapter 8 begins with the following verse. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowd followed him. So you see he went up in chapter 5. He taught all these things. And then uh, he comes down and that ends the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, before we leave this, which was last week's section, um, the Sermon on the Mount functions as the new Ten Commandments. And some scholars uh, see a serious effort by Matthew to tackle even the Ten Commandments. You know, um, honor your parents is mentioned here. Uh, in, in You've heard, but I tell you, uh, do not kill. It's mentioned in this discussion. You've heard, but I tell you. Uh, there's a way you can, some scholars do it, uh, uh, kind of very loosely see the Ten Commandments uh, repeated in the Sermon on the Mount, but with new understanding or new uh, uh, applications of these commandments. So this unit will function as the uh, constitution, the terms of the new covenant that Jesus gave. We spoke about the fact that he went up to the mountain, which is where people usually in the Old Testament will meet God and receive God's revelation. This ends the first discourse. Now we are to uh, go to the second discourse, which is about the mission uh, of the apostles. But before that, the apostle uh, Matthew fills this ep uh, area between the first discourse and the second discourse with miracles. Now here, if you uh, still haven't accepted the fact that every author has his way, Mark and Luke disperse this mir these miracles different places. So also John. Matthew puts them together because he has a purpose. These ten command the, this new commandments that Jesus has given to us are the commandments of the new term, new covenant with God. But who says so? In what authority, say the Pharisees, you teach us? Well, the authority is, you will see now the miracles that he performs, because it was said long time ago, when the Messiah comes, he will be uh, performing miracles by the power of God and healing the sick and opening the eyes of the blind and the lame will walk and all these things. And even the dead will rise. So this was a key element of uh, the Messiah's signs that he is the Messiah to perform these kind of miracles. That's why as soon as he gives us the terms of the new covenant, now he gives us a checkpoint to prove that he is the Messiah. So he starts chapter 8 and 9, which uh, is kind of a filler between the first discourse and second discourse to mention the following miracles. Let me just mention the miracles. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to read them and elaborate on them, but the healing of the man with leprosy is in verses 2 to 4. This is followed by the faith of the centurion who is not Jewish and the healing of his servant. And it's very interesting, in all these uh, miracles, usually the person comes to Jesus and Jesus questions his faith. And when this man or woman makes a statement of faith, Usually that's followed by God's grace of uh, performing that miracle. So, for example, the centurion comes and says, Lord, I don't want to bother you. You're very busy. I know if you have the power as God to command and uh, 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 my uh, servant will be healed. And this Jesus uh, perceives or sees as a total uh, uh, confession of this man's faith in Jesus as God. And in return, he heals the servant. Likewise, uh, we read about the healing of many, which uh, kind of are inserted in the middle of the chapter, chapter 18. As the miracles continue, there are three things that Matthew injects by way. Number one, the cost of following Jesus. It is not easy to follow Jesus. This is a subtitle of one of these inserts that Matthew makes. <clears throat> In the crowd, as he's talking, a teacher of the law. Now, the teacher of the law, by the way, that does, does not mean he was a lawyer. That means they took the Old Testament and they, uh, in their own way, produced, I'm not, don't call me the 626 laws. And they kind of um, impose these laws of the people of God. 
Um, so instead of going and reading the Bible, you know, from Genesis to uh, Malachi, whatever, they would read it for you. They'll make these laws and they would uh, teach you these laws. And the entire faith in God was reduced to the fulfillment of these laws. So they were the teachers of the law. They were very much respected. They were members of the Sanhedrin. They were very authoritative people. Now, one of them comes to Jesus and says, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. In the old days, because they were the authorities of interpreting these laws. So the law says, do not turn light on after sunset. So, you know, my daughter is dying. Can I light a lamp? So they will go to the, uh, to, to the teacher of, of law. That's why their disciples followed them. They became almost servants of these teachers of law because that's how they learned. They would follow them, walk with them, help them, serve them, prepare food, whatever. And in return, they learned from uh, this law. But it was a law, it was a man-made law that was man's interpretation of things in the uh, old revelation. So this uh, uh, teacher of the law thinks Jesus is like the old teachers of the law. He wants to follow him so he can learn the law. And Jesus says, in other words, you don't need to follow him because where I am is the kingdom of God. I have uh, birds have their nest, he says. Foxes have uh, dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. So the objective is not to come and serve me so you can learn the science of uh, the law of rituals and, and all, all these canons. Rather, the idea is to hear my words, my sermon, and be convinced of these words and act upon them and live these things. Be the salt of the earth and be the light of the earth. Another example brings in the old Jewish tradition. When a person dies, you have to immediately bury him because it was considered as... Um, a defilement. If you touch a dead body, it was a major thing. So this man comes and says, it's almost like a, you know, uh, uh, orchestrated stories. I want to follow you, but mother just, my, my father just died. Let me go and bury him. He says, no, because the kingdom of God is imminent, is eternal. It's much more important that the human traditions of burying and respect and honor, it's, it, it's, it's more priority and should be uh, in your life than the human customs and ancestral traditions. While these are important, we have to respect our dead people. But if you want to compare uh, burial or the kingdom of God, it should be kingdom of God first and not burial. So it's a glimpse of light as to what it means to be a true follower of Jesus, to understand his teaching and not physically be in his president's house and serve him and clean his house. Uh, and then number two, um, to realize that the gospel is uh, has priority over human traditions and man-made customs. Then Matthew continues another set of miracles. Talks about the calming of the storm, verses 22 to 27. The restoration of the two demon-possessed men, 28 to 34, and Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. In all these examples, again, they come to him, they express their faith in Jesus as God, either you are the son of David, or you can do this if you want, or they kneel in front of him, which is something they did only for God, and then uh, Jesus gives them what they requested. This is followed by uh, the second theme that uh, Evangelist Matthew interprets, which is <clears throat> apostleship, ministry uh, in the gospel. It starts by this paragraph, which only Matthew has, and we know why only he has, because only he knows this, because it's about him. The calling of Matthew. It's verses 9 uh, through 13. Uh, we can read it if you want, since he's the author of the book. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, 
many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It's a story that uh, I think the other apostles have been kind of embarrassed to write down out of respect for Matthew. Uh, it's not something to be proud of, to be a tax collector. Tax collectors were Jews, Jewish people, people of Israel, who collaborated with the invading Roman authorities, and they actually were in charge of collecting taxes. So they would know how much the Hovannesian family makes and how much the Vartanian family makes and how rich the Adurian family is. And based on that, they would collect the taxes for the emperor, for, for the Roman Empire. So they were so much despised by the Jewish people and the people of God that according to their law, we spoke about the rabbinic law, a tax collector was not qualified to be a witness in the court. That's how horrible these tax collectors were viewed by the people of God. So it's not something to be proud of to say, you know, my resume, I'm a tax collector, especially if you are, uh, you know, an Israelite. But Matthew, in a way, it's a public repentance or, uh, in a way, celebrating the grace of God who has chosen him, a tax collector, to be one of the 12 Sharaviks uh, who carried the gospel message. Uh, he publicly announces what he was. Of course, the Pharisees, typical of this uh, superficial materialistic interpretation of, um, uh, you know, the message of the divine revelation. How can, you know, the Messiah go and sit with sinners and prostitutes and, you know, the Messiah should come and sit with teachers of the law and important people and presidents and kings and queens and not with a tax collector. Uh, and of course, Jesus refers to uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I require love and not uh, mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, uh, God prefers the actual essence of offering the sacrifice, which is love and mercy and forgiveness, as opposed to the actual ritual of slaughtering and, and burning animals. And the purpose of that sacrifice was not um, to destroy animal and uh, and do the ritual and uh, as rich you are, as many you would slaughter. The purpose was because you loved uh, God so much and you would offer this precious commodity as a sacrifice to uh, beg God to, to forgive you. So, of course, Jesus answers them, quoting from uh, 6.6. 6. Jesus' question about fasting is another theme which is inserted here, which has to do with the previous theme. The same Pharisees tell Jesus, what is this? How can um, uh, your disciples are not fasting? Uh, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, but the patch will pull away from the garment, making the, uh, the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out of the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. The point here, people fast as a spiritual exercise to clear away from their hearts and minds and they, daily activities, worldly concerns, and practices and desires that may pull them away from their heart focusing on God. 
And by fasting, by clearing these things away, remaining out of these uh, attractions and what, whatever, they focus on God by praying and, uh, and meditating. Now, the objective of fasting is, of course, to get closer to God and to stay away from the sinful things that can ultimately dominate our life and can turn us into slaves of these um, practices or desires. But if God is with you, why do you need to fast? If Christ is with you, then why fast? But the day will come when Christ will be ascended back and his flock, his people, will be physically without the bridegroom amongst them, then they will fast. Then we fast now. We have Great Lent. We have fasting periods before major feast days and other fasting days. But if they understood, see, again, here, this is a comparison between Old and New Covenant. If they understood the meaning of fasting, and if they were convinced that Jesus is the anointed one of God, their question is meaningless. You don't fast when God is present among you. When Emmanuel is Emmanuel, when, when, the, when God is amongst us, you don't fast. He's with you. He's talking to you. But when the time comes and uh, Jesus leaves, then, of course, you will fast. And he gives them two examples here. If you have an old shirt, which, you know, and you bring a piece of new uh, fabric and you sew it on the part, of course, it won't because the parts where you are sewing the new garment to the old one will soon tear these connecting seams of the old uh, garment and will uh, be torn again. So it doesn't work. You have to change the whole shirt. Uh, likewise, these wine skins where they put the uh, old wine, usually the wine, because it's fermentates and there's uh, CHO, whatever, CO2, that uh, uh, comes out of this process of fermentation, um, the bag usually gets uh, expanded because of the gas. So if you have an old uh, bag that's been used for 10, 12 years, you don't put in a strong new wine because it's going to expand. And I was going to explore. So again, the idea is new traditions for the new covenant, old traditions for the old covenants. You can't just superimpose what is human practice in the old on the new covenant. You have to understand the meaning of the new covenant and then create your own uh, traditions based on these new covenants. Um, Again, we go back to a series of uh, miracles. Jesus raises a dead girl of synagogue, raising the dead. This is very, very powerful. Only God can do that. So uh, it's a very bold statement that Jesus has the power to give life back to a dead person. At the, at the same time, he heals the sick woman. Then Jesus um, heals the blind and the mute after all these miracles, through all this cha two chapters of miracles, ironically, the Pharisees say, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. When people disagree with another person, usually evil people, instead of saying, let's sit down and discuss and see which one is right, what you're saying or what we're saying. They start what is called character assassination. They undermine the credentials of the person. So to the extent that people start disbelieving in that man, you know, you know, he, this is, the, so in this case, they start saying, okay, fine. Okay. If you saw him raising the dead and uh, opening the eyes of the blind, he could have done that, but by powers of demon, he's demonic, he's possessed. That's why he's able to do that. Everything that they could do to make sure that um, Jesus' witnessing and teaching is discredited. And this leads us to the final paragraph of chapter 9, which is a segue to the second discourse. Yeah. Well, the second, to the second discourse, which is that of discipleship. 
After this long series of miracles, we read uh, the evangelist telling us, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers unto his harvest field. For the message of the gospel to reach to thousands of people, you need more than one Jesus to walk from village to village to village. Ultimately, one person has a limited span, uh, span of life. After that, he'll die. So we need to multiply this mission. So once Jesus designs the, the model, uh, the structure, now we need others to copy it and start disseminating it, forwarding it, so the message reaches as many people as possible because Jesus had compassion. People uh, are desperately in need of the message of the gospel, but it is very difficult to reach to them. This is the final paragraph in uh, chapter 9, which takes us to chapter 10, which is a chapter that includes a second discourse. So remember, the first discourse was the Sermon on the Mount, the first book of Matthew. Now, the second one is about discipleships. Discipleship. Let us read that, please, if you can open your book to chapter 10. All right. Jesus called the 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles and the names are mentioned. Let me immediately uh, say here that the names differ from list to list. The names of the apostles in the Gospels and the New Testament are mentioned four times. There are four lists of the apostles. These are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the book of Acts. The names differ because in those days, um, Israelites or Jewish people had two names, first and second name. Usually, the first name would be a Roman and Hellenistic name, which would be easy to be used in the marketplace with the Roman authorities. And the second name usually would be, would be a Hebrew name, a Jewish name, just like uh, many people in uh, certain parts of the world, like America, would have a baptismal name, first name and a baptismal name. So like, it will be Timothy Varujan, or I know, uh, uh, Craig uh, Sogomon, something like that. So the first name will be Americanized name, and the second name will be Armenian. Um, that's why some of the lists mention uh, their official uh, Hellenistic name. Others will mention uh, their uh, Hebrew name. Also, in some cases, like Bartholomew, uh, in some cases, we'll, we'll read Bartholomew. Others will read Tade, the son, son of Telami. Now, Bartholomew means the son of, so it's a Hebrew compound name. Some of them mentioned Bartholomew as one name. Others are bar Thalami, the son of Thalami. Uh, and of course, the 12 names include uh, Judas Iscariot. These 12, uh, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, it is interesting to remember Jesus sending these apostles out, but he hasn't yet fulfilled the new covenant. He hasn't yet died on the cross. He has it conquered. 
the shackles of sin and death. So this is obviously, a, as I say in French, stage. It's an internship. He's practicing. He's preparing them because he just told us there's desperate need for people to continue um, or duplicate this message. So they're preaching exactly what he is preaching. They're not preaching Christos Hariavi Merelot. This is a practice. That's why he says, do not go to the Gentiles, because that uh, appearance of the Son of God in glory has not yet happened. He has not yet come out of the dead. So the story re you know, resonates to all over the Roman Empire. Um, and that's why he says, go only to uh, the Jewish people. He also says, do not go to the Samaritans because they also have rejected uh, God's covenants. Uh, so this goes. This is only a practice amongst ourselves. You go to our people and you preach to them. What are they doing? They are doing exactly what the Messiah was supposed to do when he comes, which is heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have sickness, drive out demons. And this should be done not in return for any remuneration, because the Messiah does this as part of him fulfilling the covenant of God with his people, and they as extensions of the Messiah will continue doing the same thing. Our Lord uh, uh, admits that they will be going like lost sheep. Uh, no, they're going to the lost sheep of Israel. So these are people who in the past knew about God and God's covenant, but are now lost. So it's an effort to bring them back to the fold, uh, to being committed to a covenant with God. Okay, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No back for the journey, no extra shirts or sandals or staff for the workers is worth with his keep, uh, worth his keep. In other words, uh, those who appreciate your preaching of uh, the, the good news, they will take care of you. Don't worry. People will take care of uh, the apostles who go out to preach. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for someone worthy uh, to stay in their house until you leave. As you enter the house, give it your greetings. Shalom. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave at home or town and shake the dust of your feet. Even the dust of your house, I don't want. I leave it to you. I go out without anything from you. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Sodom and Gomorrah were towns in the Old Testament which rejected God's will and openly and bluntly lived a lifestyle which was against God's will. They were always mentioned as a symbol, as example uh, of sinful people uh, who will be destroyed by the wrath of God. Jesus saying those who hear the terms of the gospel and reject it, their state in the day of judgment will be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. One of the symbols of uh, snakes is that it's shrewd. That's why our vartabids, uh, when they teach, they carry a staff with two snakes, if you've seen it. Uh, because according to Jesus, they're, they're a shrewd jarbing. And of course, dove is a sign of innocence. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and be flogged in synagogues on my account, and you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. In other words, just like this world rejected me or rejects me, they will reject you because you, you are now part of me. You are my team. When you go out, basically you are duplication of what I do, which, of course, angers Satan and angers people of principalities and authorities in this fallen world. So they will reject you just like they rejected me. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children uh, will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. 
but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Uh, again, they will betray you to death, death, uh, they will torture you, but brother will betray brother, and father his child, and children will reject against their parents, uh, put them to death, and this all this because of me. Because members of the family will convert to Christianity, will be followers of Jesus, others will not, and they will go to the authorities and tell on these people, and that's exactly what happened. The first century of Christianity is full of these, in fact, uh, up until recently, you know, whenever Christianity was persecuted in the Soviet era, if you wanted to terminate the career of the man, you go and tell him this man went to H.P. Azin and goes to church every Sunday. And that was the end of his uh, dossier was closed and uh, there was no more career for him. So, Yes, Jesus came to preach peace, uh, but uh, his gospel will become a reason for families being divided against each other and ultimately members of the family taking other members to the authorities and even to death. Our Lord is not arrogant and he says, know your limitations. So when you're persecuted, flee, go to another place, you know, uh, don't run to the enemies and say, you I am a Christian and God will help me. If they persecute you, you run away, flee. Because uh, it's better you remain alive and you preach and witness the gospel as opposed to just dying for no reason. If you are arrested, do not worry because the spirit will talk. So if you are caught because of witnessing to the gospel and they start interrogating you, or don't worry because God will give you the wisdom to answer these people. I think I'm going back to I tell you, yeah. What does it mean? I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. In the old, in the New Testament, Son of Man comes or comes in glory or he's, he appears in glory is a reference to his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. So in other words, uh, you don't have years because in a few months, uh, Judas is going to betray me and I'm going to be arrested and soon people will see the Son of Man come. We'll see how I will die on the cross and three days later rise, miraculously rise and ascend to heaven. Students are not about the teacher nor servants about their masters. It is enough for the student to be like the teacher and servants to be like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Be'el Zebul, how much more the members of his household. Obviously, if they rejected Jesus and said he is satanic, he's possessed, which they just told him, of course, they're going to do the same thing for his apostles. Thus, do not be afraid, for there is nothing concealed that will not be dis uh, disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ears, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's will. And even the very hair of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The point is, as much as you can, flee these persecutions. Uh, we want you alive to continue witnessing and teaching. But if you are arrested, don't panic. Don't worry. The Spirit, or Spirit will lead you, will talk on behalf of you. And um, don't worry, because ultimately, the truth will be revealed. So what is hidden, what is secret, the day will come in the kingdom of God, where everything will be revealed. Uh, no need to be afraid there to be secretive. Your light must shine. Go boldly and preach. When I tell you, run away and flee, that doesn't mean be afraid and not preach. Go preach, be bold, teach, uh, but be 
uh, shrewd like the snakes. Do not be afraid of worldly authorities who can kill your body. Rather be afraid of the day of judgment who can kill the body and the soul and throw you in hell. So uh, worldly principalities can kill your body, that's it. But uh, if you anger God, if you go against God's will, uh, the consequences are uh, total and utter destruction and um, the suffering of hell. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Again, faith is not something in your heart only. It must be shared. People must know uh, that you are a disciple of Christ. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father and uh, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Uh, again, because members of the family will be divided. Uh, Jesus' mission is not peace on this earth because this earth is a fallen earth. He calls Satan the ruler of this earth. Uh, Jesus' message is eternal life, salvation, endless joy of being in his presence with our loved ones. Other than that, families will be divided, sons against fathers, daughters against mother, and um, enemies will divide the household. Very, very strong statement. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Or it does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This was my first sermon when I was first ordained 32 years ago. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. There's an interesting nuance here that we should be aware of. Whoever uh, loves their father more than uh, me. That means whoever prefers the fatherly ancestral tradition over my gospel. Whoever is blinded by tradition that prefers blindly following the laws of the old and and the rabbinic teachings, because that's how their father and their grandfather grew up and did. Um, it's not about Jesus being narcissistic. Do you love me? When I was a child, there was a very painful question. People would ask me, do you love your mom or your dad? It was a very, especially when my both parents were there, it's a difficult question. How, how would you answer it? Jesus is not being narcissistic and do you love me more than your mother? The point is, if you prefer blindly following your mom's and dad's traditions over being enlightened by my gospel, in that sense, you're preferring them over me, uh, then you know you're not worthy of me. And ultimately, be ready to suffer. In this fallen world, uh, following the gospel of Jesus Christ means being ready to suffer. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Be ready to be suffering for me. Anyone who welcomes you, welcomes. Anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet, uh, as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever welcomes righteous person, as a righteous person will receive righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives a cup of water to one of these little ones, my disciples, truly I tell you, the person will certainly not lose their reward. Sorry, I'm reading it very quickly. I'm trying to finish by eight o'clock. I'm squeezing all these, but uh, that's the end of our session today. If you have any questions or comments, we've finished the second discourse now, which is a discourse about discipleship. Our Lord is sending the disciples out as a practice. Uh, again, the gospel is not fulfilled yet. He hasn't been resurrected yet. That's why he's limiting this stagiary, the training to only the local people. The people are fully aware of the gospel, of the prophecies and, and the writings. And they're supposed to practice by imitating what he does, which is preach, witness, heal the sick, and bring the word of God to the communities.